Hi everyone, my name is Courtney and welcome or welcome back to my channel. And today I'm going to be continuing my seasonal reading vlog series. Basically, my seasonal reading vlog series is every season I've been using booktube recommendation videos as a way to kind of boil down and figure out how we recommend books for every season here on booktube and how we kind of think of every season and both through books and just in general. And so today we are entering our final season, which is going to be summer. So yes, I have been doing these videos for every season since fall. I feel like I have a very good understanding of the seasons, what we recommend, what I personally would recommend, but also like, hey, I made it through all these seasons. We did it. I didn't give up on this project. I'm pretty proud of myself for that. So at the end of this video, I will of course be wrapping up summer, but I will also be wrapping up this series and kind of discussing my thoughts, feelings about the different seasons in general. Before we get into that, let us d get into discussing summer and then get into the reading vlog itself. So for me, summer just means reading. It's the time where as a kid, you were out of school, you had no responsibilities, and so you could do whatever you wanted. And for me, that was devouring books. I was always a big reader. It's what I liked to do over the summer. I was always just trying to read as much as possible, always invading my local library. And so for me at least, summer is a pretty expansive season. It can mean a lot of different things. Includes, I would say, probably the biggest range of genres, the biggest range of tone. And while I'm always looking for like a summery setting in my book for summer, I would say it's not necessarily as important as maybe winter or some of the other seasons. For me, my personal buzzword are nostalgia, whimsical, transportive, fun, and escape, vacation. For me, summer is a long season, and because of that, in my brain, I kind of break it down into sections. So first off, when we start summer, we enter into Pride Month. So of course, queer books are a big part of my summer reading. Summer after queer books is just like whatever you want to read. It's, again, nostalgic reads, I'm thinking of those books that I was reading as a kid. It's escapist fantasy, it's romance, it's Newbery Award books. Like there's some literary stuff, there is some fun stuff. It's just kind of all over the place. And from there, we enter into what I think of as Deep Summer. I've talked about this in kind of my recommendation videos. I've been seeing a lot of books recommended for like the harsher seasons. And I would say that they fall more into summer than they do say fall or winter. And I think people are confusing like a deep summer with the harsh winter atmosphere. So now that we finally entered summer, I can talk about deep summer. So to me, when I think of deep summer, I think of Ghibli films, specifically Hayao Miyazaki. To me, every Hayao Miyazaki film is a summer movie. It just is. We have Totoro, we have Ponyo, The Secrets of Arietti, we have Kiki's Delivery Service, and maybe even a little bit Howl's Moving Castle and Laputa, where there is more vibes, there is more downtime between scenes, there's like a return to nature, a beautifulness, a escape, a nostalgia. To me, those are like the breathy, feel-good kind of summer videos. And then Deep Summer are his other films, the more intense ones. I'm thinking Spirited Away. I'm thinking Princess Mononoke. I'm thinking The Wind Rises. I'm thinking Nausicaa and like the kind of darker moments of Howl. Those to me are Deep Summer. It's high intensity, has like all of the other stuff that we're thinking about from the other films, like downtime, breaths of fresh air, returns to nature, that kind of thing. But it has more intensity. It has these darker pockets of emotion. Deep summer is like the opposite of winter. It is harsh, but not from like winteriness. It's from hotness, from humidity. It's like that deep summer feeling, that unsettling feeling. There's an oppressiveness. There's an evil lurking underneath. And for this, I want to see more introspective books. I want to see more sci-fi books. I want to see those desert pirate fantasy books. It's those classics that you're reading for school. It's the antithesis to winter. So to me, that's what deep summer is. It's the kind of transition from like the fun happiness of like summer vacation into like this dark, deep intensity. I think often people for summer books, they think of escapist fantasy. They think of vacation type books, but people also recommend mystery thrillers, horror. That's what I'm thinking of, a little bit more intensity. And so our final kind of section of summer is prepping 
into the school year. There's kind of a newness and excitement, at least for me. Also like a little bit of dread. There's like a slight change in the weather. For me in California, that means Santa Ana's. It means more heat, more intensity, but it's also the hope for something colder to come. And that's kind of the breath of summer to me. It is very expansive. It's a lot of things. I think this is how I personally think of summer. I think most people do not think of summer like this. For most people, I think we're gonna see a lot of fun escapist books. We're gonna see romance. We're gonna see mystery thriller. We're gonna maybe see some sci-fi, but it's also like hot girl summer. And a lot of interesting trends in how people define the seasons. For autumn, there's dark academia and Christian girl autumn. Winter has nothing, but spring is like cottage core. And for summer, we have hot girl summer. This was a term coined by black TikTokers, I believe. And it was either last year or the year before. And it's kind of like this indulgence in yourself is how I understand it. It's like, do what you want, party, have a good time, but also maybe better yourself a little bit. Do what you want, read a good book on the beach. Hot Girl Summer is like about going out, doing what you want, having fun. And I believe for me at least, understanding the Hot Girl Summer trend was important to understanding the difference between summer and spring because a lot of people I think are going to be recommending very similar books for spring and summer. The difference between spring and summer is that spring is more sweet, it's more blooming, it's just coming into itself. Whereas summer is more rambunctious, it's more boisterous, it's a little bit more chaotic all over the place. So now that we understand how I think of summer, how I think other people are going to think of summer, let's get into the actual recommendations. Going into this, my struggle in curating this recommendation video list was finding recommendations from booktubers. Summer is like the season of betterment and it's the season for like a lot of lifestyle vloggers and just other types of video content creators to make summer reading lists. And like, that's great, but I'm trying to figure out what our community, our booktube community is thinking of summer and getting their recommendations and not necessarily looking at the outside people, the people that are not in our pocket. Because they're not as big readers, they're gonna be recommending a lot of the same stuff as each other. And they're also gonna be recommending like a lot of self-help, that kind of stuff. And that's not really what we're looking for for my video series. So that's first off, that was one of the hardest things that I was running into. Then the other problem I was running into when trying to curate my list, I was finding a lot of recommendation videos that were TBR videos. So they would recommend a couple books or they would recommend books that they were anticipating reading or it was just their TBRs. And for some reason, like it would come up when I was looking up recommendation videos. I found it very difficult, very difficult to find recommendation videos without that TBR list attached. I love these TBR videos. They're some of my favorite videos, but I'm looking for recommendations. I want to know what people are recommending for summer itself. And because it was so hard to one, find booktubers and to two, find recommendation videos, seasonal recommendation videos, like every season, this is when I had a hard time finding diversity. When it becomes hard to find videos for a specific topic, it also then becomes hard to find those diverse readers. And it's not that they don't exist, it's that the algorithm is pretty sucky to them and they just fall under piles and piles and piles, these white straight female vloggers that are just recommending the same types of books over over and over again. We run into this problem with every season, but summer was really hard because again, I was having a hard time just finding straight recommendation videos where it was a seasonal recommendation video. And then my other worry is that everything is gonna be horror, mystery, thriller, and romance, which are kind of my least read genres. But without further ado, I'm gonna research, I'm gonna watch these videos, and I'm gonna compile what information I found. So I'm back with the research, the data, if you will. So let's kind of go over the recommendations. First off, I want to say, like, I didn't recommend any of my summer picks yet. I haven't talked about any of my summer picks. For me, summer is like, I'll know it when I see it because it encompasses so much, like I said. It's everything from Percy Jackson, where you have the nostalgia, the summer type vibes, the middle grade, all the way to things like Circe, where it is a little bit more intense, a little bit more literary, but again, has that like magical, whimsical quality to it. But first, let's get into what the booktubers I found were recommending. So I started off with 20, 21 videos and I whittled it down to 17 and took out the three outliers where they were either recommending, I found books that they hadn't read yet or their recommendations were just like wildly out of left field and kind of focused in on the more similar videos to get a little bit more homogeny. In that, I was looking not just at summer recommendation videos, I was using
using the term hot girl summer to kind of find some other in the same wheelhouse recommendations because I was using both of those kind of key terms as well as looking to booktubers that I like and watch I was really surprised in like how interested I was in so many of the books like there were just a lot of really really good recommendations of stuff that I'm like hey yeah that does seem summery and yes I'm interested in reading that but like don't worry because like the books I thought I would see on here were definitely recommended and were definitely recommended a lot we can't escape certain books that's fine but overall I was pretty impressed by summer summer is like my favorite in the way that I used to love having summer vacation but seasonally it's not my vibe I'm more of a winter fall girly so I forgot to include my thoughts on the buzzwords I came up with or that I found in people's videos there were not a ton but these were kind of the ones that we were seeing. A lot of hot, a lot of sun, a lot of humidity, a lot of heat words, but also like ocean, pool, vacation, escape, quest, and again, cozy. Let's look at the pie chart. I was really surprised by this. I was really expecting a lot more mystery, thriller, and horror. They were present, but just a lot less present than I thought they would be. And then of course, there's kind of like an even split between romance and sci-fi fantasy. Romance, it was a lot of the same books being recommended, but when you count up those recommendations, it was being recommended the same amount as sci-fi. Let's cover the books that I have read. I can kind of rate them as to how summary I think they are. So in my chart, I started off with the books that I felt like were definitely not recommended for the right season, but Emily Wilde, it's one that I started reading in spring. I knew it was definitively a winter or at least a transition winter book. It should not have been recommended for summer. The fifth season, I feel like, yes, it does have that harsh intent but it's more desolate. It's more cold. It's more disaster based. For me, it's like winter fall. Yoke, I believe, happens in like a fall semester. It's hard-hitting contemporary. Again, I feel like it happens in like November. I believe like her power's shutting off and she like doesn't have heat. It's to me a fall book. Vicious, another fall book. Like I think I could read it in summer, like could have a good time with it, but it has like that darkness. It's really similar to books like Frankenstein. It like kind of calls to those kind of vibes, the Frankenstein, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde type literary tropes. And then for me, Savior's Book Cafe and Half a Soul, those two are like spring. One is like a fun, cutesy, cozy fantasy romance type vibes. Actually, yeah, they're both that. They're both cozy, sweet fantasy romance type vibes, which fits more into the spring, cozy, cottage quarry type vibes. But the rest of the recommendations, like I said, were summer. Winter, spring, we were seeing a lot of books that I was like, especially spring, I was like, why are these being recommended? These feel like they fit into other seasons. But summer, summer, I feel like people, they get it. They really get it. Maybe the most out of any season. House Moving Castle, to me, that's a summer book, baby. We've seen it on almost every recommendation video list, but it's finally ended up in the right category. She Drives Me Crazy, Heartstopper, Geekerella. Heartstopper, we've seen recommended a lot, even in winter, but it's finally ended up in the right category. But all three of those books, they're fun, YA contemporaries, they fit into the summer season. Then we see stuff like Beloved, The Bluest Eye, even Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo. These are our literary picks. And yes, it makes sense. Beloved, The Blue Aside. I read both of those in summer. They feel like those books that you read prepping for the school year, books that you were assigned during the summer. Trust Exercise is a weird one. I believe it mostly happens in a summer vacation, or at least I kind of remember like kids running around during summer break. Feels summery to me. Like, yeah, okay, that makes sense. It's a literary fiction you would read in summer. Seven Husbands. It feels summery. It's Hollywood. It's like a blockbuster book. I feel like that's the best way to describe summer is that it's your blockbuster books. You're getting your action-y sci-fi books, you're getting your horror, mystery, thriller type things, you're getting your romance, you're getting your big screen movies that you and your mom are gonna go watch because you can't decide on a movie that you both like. Going into romance, we saw a lot of Emily Henry beach read summer books. Same with Red, Bright, and Royal Blue. I read this on a beach. It is a summery beach book. It's got the romance, it's got the cute aspect. It's fun, it's a little quirky, a little chaotic, perfect summer book. Getting into our fantasy picks that I have read, an absolute remarkable thing. Hank Green is like a summer person to me. Like he has that chaotic energy, boisterousness. Of course his books fit that kind of atmosphere too, but there's also a little bit of introspection, a little bit of that summer literariness. The House in the Cerulean Sea, yeah, it fits there. We've seen it recommended through at least three seasons. Honestly, it might've been recommended every season, but I feel like it definitively fits into summer. The Girl Beneath the Sea and Deeper Waters, Akata Witch, teen fantasy novels. We got mermaids, we got pirates, we got ocean, 
Dragon. We got weird villainous Manwa stuff. We got summer witch kids. It's a very specific type of magic. And then She Who Becomes a Sun, it's a more intense fantasy. I could see it recommended for fall. I probably wouldn't bat an eye at it, but to me it feels summer. That cover feels summer. And then finishing off the list of books that I've recommended, we have The Lightning Thief, we have Kiki's Delivery Service. They're quintessential nostalgic middle grade reads. They just feel perfect for summer, especially Percy Jackson with that summer camp stuff. So let's get back into that recommendations. In those 17 videos I watched, I was recommended 144 different books. Some of them were repeats. Like I said, it was a lot of romance and a lot of sci-fi fantasy. And this is like a consistent number. This is the amount of books that we're seeing for the 20 so videos that I tend to pick for this recommendation series, about 140 books. I'm not sure where this falls in the series with repeats. It's not the most repeats we've seen, but it's not like the least amount of repeats we've seen either. I feel like Winter probably had the most repeats. For books that are recommended more than once, we have a solid eight. So we were liars. It was one I knew was gonna pop up more than once and I was not surprised to see it on the read more than once category. Certain Hunger, pretty happy to see that. Literary Fiction, The Summer I Turned Pretty. Another one I was expecting to see on there because it's like that YA can contemporary summer beach kind of stuff. Don't really want to read it, but not surprised to see it. Seven Days in June, another one I was pleasantly surprised to see on here. It has June in the title. Makes sense why it's recommended. It's literary fiction, but I think it is romance -y or like based on a relationship. I saw a bunch of Sally Rooney recommended, which kind of fits into those literary fiction type vibes. Full of Stars and Teeth, a little bit more happy to see this one on repeat because it's a YA book, but it's got like water, magic, something on a beach magic. Cause when I'm thinking fantasy, summer fantasy, I'm thinking pirates, mermaids, and deserts. Like one of those three. For adult romance, we have It Happened One Summer. Tessa Bailey, I have no interest in reading this kind of romance book, but yeah, it makes sense. It's a beachy romance. It's what you're gonna read on the beach. And then take a hint, Danny Brown. Danny Brown, we've seen a lot of recommendations for in spring. I feel like I might've even seen her in fall and winter too, to be honest, but she makes the most sense in summer because it's a romance. That's just how I think of it. I really only want to read romance at maybe a little bit in February, the beginning of spring, and then in summer. For our books that are recommended more than once, we have four titles, and honestly, none of them are really that surprising. Coming in at a whopping three recommendations, we have The Unhoneymooners, which is an adult romance title. It might have a beach vacation type vibes in it. Again, it's adult romance. I was not surprised to see this recommended multiple times. Another title that was recommended three times, we have Love and Gelato. This is Summer Vacation, Girl in Italy. Might have been my thing when I was younger, but not really anymore. Thought The Summer I Turned Pretty would have gotten more recommendations than this one, but I'm not really surprised that this one was recommended. And then going into our last two, these were the ones I expected. I was expecting Malibu Rising. I was expecting Emily Henry. I knew they would be here. I knew they would show up. And oh my God, Malibu Rising was recommended four times. I still don't want to read it. Oh my God, people really want you to read Malibu Rising, which I think is really interesting because I remember it not being such a popular book. I felt like it was kind of super loved at first, but here it is, recommended four times. And then coming in with our most recommendations, we have Emily Henry, which was recommended a whopping six times. Have read her YA stuff, two of her YA books, really, really loved them. I liked what she was doing in the YA sphere. When she went to adult romance, like I was not mad at it. I didn't hate Bee Tree, but it was just kind of okay to me. There was nothing that really made me love the book, but like I could see why people really like it. Oh my god, did people recommend her? And they didn't just recommend Beach Read or one of the other books. Oh no, it was always recommending Emily Henry. I feel like for every single video, it was recommending all of her books. So she was our top contender for what is a summer book, which makes sense. It's romance heavy, but it's a little literary leaning, a little sad girl summer, a little bit more than just like a fun Beach Read. So okay, sure, makes sense. So let's look at my TBR. Like I said, there were a ton of titles I was interested in. I I boiled it down and from there I chopped out some ones that I felt like were repeating certain things and then I added a couple of my own titles to the recommendations. The categories I'm trying to hit. We of course want to hit a romance, just a traditional romance. 
And then of course, we also want to hit a fantasy. I would like something middle grade, something graphic novel, something that kind of hits off that nostalgia, that Percy Jackson type thing. And I would also like something that, even though horror and mystery thriller weren't recommended a lot, like maybe something literary with like horror or sci-fi elements maybe in there. And these are kind of similar to the genres that we've had in the past. Like there's always been a fantasy. There's always been some type of graphic novel pick most of the time. Time. there's always been some type of literary pick and there's also always been like some kind of fourth category whether that be horror mystery thriller the genres we're seeing recommended the genres that I'm picking up for the challenge to fulfill the kind of pie chart it's been kind of the same across all genres but those are just the popular genres on booktube and the subcategories the themes the tropes that's what makes these books so different and also like the amount like again romance really popular this season versus others so with that in mind let's look at my TBR what I whittled down to. So the top two rows are the books that were recommended at least once from different creators. So I have The Girl from the Sea and Tide Song, Mermaid, Fantasy, Graphic Novel, Middle Grade-ish Graphic Novel. I have A Certain Hunger and Our Wives Under the Sea, which are those lit fit books. We have We Hunt the Flames, YA Fantasy, Gods of Jade and Shadow, which is adult fantasy, Into the Drowning Deep, I think it's fantasy horror. I think there's mermaids or some type of sea creature involved. Getting into some more literary fiction, we have Their Eyes Were Watching Gods, Seven Days in June, Kake Yi. If I pick that one, I will find out how to say it. And then getting into the next three, I have Twelve Kings, which is, I think, desert fantasy, The Adventures of Emil Serafi, pirate fantasy, and then The Unhoneymooners coming in with that romance pick. Again, it was a lot of the same romance recommended over and over again. A lot of Tessa Bailey, a a lot of YA picks, honestly, a lot of Emily Henry and The Unhoneymooners. Those were the ones that I was seeing. And of my choices, I feel like The Unhoneymooners is the one I would pick. And so at the bottom, these are the titles that I snuck on that were not part of the recommendations, but I feel like fit the vibes. So I have The Sun and the Star, which fits into the Percy Jackson recommendations, which we did see on the list at least once, I believe. City of Brass, one I was really surprised was not recommended. I feel like happens in Egypt, summer, hot, desert type vibes, Trail of Light, I think this is adult paranormal road trip kind of vibes, so I feel like it fits into that. And then Empire of Sand, Desert Fantasy. Again, I feel like it fits in to the summer type vibes. And I didn't know this, but Tasha Suri wrote The Jasmine Throne, which is also on my list. I thought of putting that on as my sneak recommendation, but then I realized I put the author on twice, so I only snuck her on once. For my romance pick, pretty obvious, I picked The Unhoneymooners. It's one that my mom has read, so it's already on my shelf, so it was an easy one to pick. But I'm not discounting it. Maybe I'll like it. I've been getting into adult romance. They've all been gay, but you know, maybe I'll like this one. For my fantasy, I decided to go the desert route and I picked my own pick, which is going to be Empire of Sands. This is one that's been interesting me. I wanted to pick one that was more romancey because I felt like I didn't have a lot of romance picks to pick from for the actual romance. And I just felt like the list needed a little bit more. For my literary fiction pick, I'm leaning towards Seven Days in June, which again, and has that romance to it, a subcategory, but it has that literary hot girl, sad girl, summer type vibes. And then for my other pick, I'm leaning towards a graphic novel. I've read a graphic novel for three out of my four recommendations. So the girl from the sea is kind of what I'm leaning towards. Then for my fifth pick, I just felt like I needed another literary fiction on there. I felt like I needed some type of ocean, some type of watery book since I went desert fantasy route. So for now, I have Our Wives Under the Sea as a contender, as one I could possibly read. But yeah, I feel like that kind of rounds out our list. Just on a basic level breakdown, we have beachy reads, we have desert, we have water, ocean, and we have romance as a subcategory for a lot of these. Those are the books that people are recommending for summer. Let's start on this journey. Let's read these books and decide if they are in fact summary books and what summer really means as a reading season. I might as well record while I still have this cute outfit on. So yes, recording for posterity, the cute little fit. As you can probably assume, I just went to Oppenheimer. No, I went to Barbie, obviously. My lipstick and everything looked a lot cuter. Probably my makeup looked better too earlier because I cried a lot during Barbie, which I was not expecting. Barbie was excellent. Unfortunately, it means the weekend is almost over now because I had to wait to see Barbie on Sunday. I have started the process of 
the reading vlog and so for the summer reading I have since picked up my first book which is Empire of Sands by Tasha Suri and this is a desert fantasy but I'm about eight chapters into this and I'm really really liking it. If you like The Bear and the Nightingale, if you like The Wolf and the Woodsman, Uprooted, it's very comparable to that. Also very reminiscent of the Girl of Fire and Thorn series, that's what I was thinking of. It's like that but obviously a different type of setting, not a traditional western fantasy which I'm loving. It's definitely we've had the desert, we have the desert storms, it's giving that heat hot summer vibe which is perfect for a summer fantasy read. I'm really really liking it. It's like the perfect setting. So yeah first book of summer going super great and just having a very summery day honestly. Summer reading vlog going good and I will let you know as I get more into the book because I'm really not that far. So I think I might have been in a little bit of like Barbie fever when I was talking about starting Empire of Sands. So let's kind of go over it again. So Empire of Sands is an adult fantasy series. It is a duology. This is book one obviously and it is a desert fantasy. So for sure it has like the adventure, the desert, it's given the heat. But yes, I have since looked it up and the author is British and born to two Punjabi parents and she often visited India. I think there are references to some Indian clothing and foods, but I don't think the location is entirely inspired by Indian culture customs. I'm not sure. Pretty underhyped. You don't hear about this series a lot, especially in comparison to The Jasmine Throne, which like really popped off. But this follows our main character Mecha who is the daughter of one of the governors of this empire. She is kind of outcasted by her family because she was born of the first wife and not the current wife and her mother is from a clan who are minority people in this land and kind of considered savages for their traditions and like how they go about life. So Meha is like kind of outcasted by the stepmother and just like a lot of the servants and stuff but she also is kind of like sheltered and revered like you know she's very much protected because of her status she's also looked down upon because of her heritage and her dark-skinned looks so it's a lot of very interesting things coming together and so from there she basically has rituals that she performs which are connected to like the old gods. These rituals like she's not really supposed to do but she does them because they're important to her. The emperor finds out about her magical power. The maha who is like the religious leader is basically gives her a deal and is like hey I need you to marry this dude for me and she's like mm, I don't really have a choice do I? When you say I have to do it I kind of have to do it. You're kind of a big deal. So yes she is forced into an arranged marriage with this other person who is is Ahmen. Together they go through the desert to the temple where the Maha lives and uh, yes they are forced into an arranged marriage and she finds out that he is also of not the same blood but like they're both of the same minority race and they both like practice the rituals and stuff like that. There's a little bit more to their rituals than she always assumed. There is magic and from there we kind of just get more into their situation and like why they've been forced together and like what they have to do. Trigger warnings for forced marriage and forced consummation. Like when they consummate they are like both in love with each other at that point like been a long time but like it is a forced situation still. I really really like this. Ahman is a great male lead. He's like very like strong and sullen kind of type guy but also like he has like a hint of like softness that peeks through. He's definitely like one of those characters that it's like he would have been soft if he had grown up on other circumstances. He's not violent. He's not like a bad person. He just like it has to be very closed off because of the way he grew up and like the pressure that he's under. He's just very sweet. I really like him. And then our main character, again, I think she's just really interesting. She has a lot of these like contradictory things going on in her life, but I will say that there is like a lot of telling about her and not a lot of really showing about her personality, if that makes sense. One of the things that I think is really interesting is that there's a beginning section where she talks about how she is really good at lying and has to lie a lot to kind of 
be able to get away with stuff in under her stepmother and then later on it kind of brings up lying again the lying is kind of important to the series them trying to get out of their situation so like that could have been utilized more i'm not saying like make her a pathological liar but like kind of put the lying as a through line of her character and like what she does like a governor's daughter she's sheltered she's suddenly in this harsh life but also she's like used to being an outcast we like saw these things and like heard about these things but i just wanted those things to affect like her decisions and her personality like a little bit more like she's a very lonely person i feel like that could have been utilized more overall i really like the two main characters and i like how they connect because like both of them are from this minority race this whole book is like old gods versus like new god kind of situation like a lot of these like romance fantasy type books like the bear and the nightingale and stuff and this one is really interesting because the two main characters are actually like kind of on the same side in that like religion respect so it's just like a different dynamic they just have a really good foundation for a relationship they have similarities with each other they are both like incredibly lonely people and have had to deal with a lot so it really makes sense to me like why they're falling in love i just felt like i needed a little bit more um from the main character specifically about like why she was doing certain things her thoughts behind them this book is like a lot of things happening to her and i'm sure she's going to enact on the plot starting like now in the end game kind of a thing that makes sense to me because she is growing as a character and like learning about the world and stuff i don't think she felt flat it just felt like her life experiences weren't really affecting the plot and because like she is such a specific person i would have liked that but overall this is really really good definitely would recommend it it's definitely like in my wheelhouse of things i like bear and the nightingale fans where are you at because this is for you most certainly i'm gonna definitely read this definitely gonna finish the series now but i'm almost done i have like less than 20 percent, i think but 100 percent for sure this is really good and it's perfect for summer it's got the romance it's got the fantasy aspects it's got the adventure the desert kind of vibes that i was looking for perfect read for this reading vlog so i just finished empire of sand this morning and it was really good i really enjoyed it i do believe this is tasha's series debut not that it feels like a debut but like i could see that the author has a lot of room to grow it's definitely like romanticy but there is a lot of plot stuff but it's mainly focused on the romance i would say as the book stands the character pretty good they could use a little bit more development but overall pretty good the writing excellent she's an excellent writer she has a very beautiful lyrical way of writing but without it being too flowery i feel like it's just a very good balanced writing very elegant writing in my opinion the plot that was where i could see a little bit more room for growth i wanted the characters to impact the plot a little bit more for the main characters to be the ones moving the plot forward to see like the connection between a character growing into their power and you know that plot coming because of their consequences choices whatever like, it, like those points just like weren't quite connecting to me personally it did feel a lot like random characters making choices and just like the plot kind of happening to the characters and like it makes sense these characters are in like a very strict situation very akin to they call it slavery basically they are kind of enslaved by the like evil guy but also the book takes a lot of time to give the characters as much agency as possible the book is a lot about like the idea of choices so i would have liked to see that idea play a little bit more into the text but as far as like romance relationship dynamics that was great really really excellent you got the writing you kind of got the characters you got the dynamics once she's able to like get the plot make it a little bit more complex a little bit more developed make it again more about cause and effect with those characters i feel like she's you know she's gonna be really really good and i can see that so yeah i'm really excited to read the second book of this series and then get into the jasmine throne series because i think she will probably be really really excellent in that i really enjoyed this i don't know why it's so underhyped i'm giving this like a 3.5 3.75 stars really really enjoyable really engrossing to read i was definitely on the edge of my seat for a lot of it i wanted to know more about stuff it's doing all the good things there's also room for growth which i i actually like it's a great transition book from ya to adult a great like romanticy if you don't want too much romance and and it's perfect for like Baron the Nightingale fans, Girl of Fire and Thorns, The Wolf and the Woodsman. Like it's very much those vibes, but taken in a different setting. We still have to get through the literary pick, the romance pick, and my graphic novel pick. So there's a lot 
to learn about summer, but so far the first book, very summer vibes. That's what I want. I want adventure. I want action. I want magic and whimsy and a different setting than you're gonna get in a winter fantasy. So this was everything that I could possibly want for for a summer fantasy. Escapist, but still like really grounded in characters and stuff. Really, really great. Maybe you'd want a little bit more action plot for a summer fantasy, but overall really, really good. All there's left to is to read more books. So it is finally Friday. Thank God I am so tired this week. I don't really have any plans or errands to run, I don't think, or not too many at least. I'm really excited to like veg out, read a lot, but the thing is, this is, <laughs> if you don't know, it's July 28th. I guess you wouldn't know what day it is, but like, if you don't know what's on July 28th, let me enlighten you. The second season of Good Omens comes out, and I am a pretty hard Good Omens fan. I haven't read the book yet. I want to. I want to read it on audiobook with the full cast. really like Good Omens, and I'm really excited for the new season. I did watch one episode last night, the first one obviously, and like I'm trying so hard not to be spoiled. I was very close to getting spoiled last night because one of the scenes in the first episode is a scene where Crowley does a little sorry dance and it is the cutest and funniest thing I've ever seen. And so I just, I wanted a video of it and that's how I almost got spoiled. Literally I just went back on Amazon Prime and watched that scene like 10, 15 times because it is so funny and I love it and I hope it shows up again. <laughs> Basically we're just getting a little backstory about the creation and Crowley and Aziraphale as angels. And then we're just kind of getting set up for what the mystery or whatever's gonna be happening in this show. One of the big things is that it seems like it's been like a couple years since the Antichrist thing of the last season. Crowley and Aziraphale have had a tiff. It seems like they're not as close par for the course for them but now it seems like they're gonna have actual beef with each other like more significant beef hope we find out why they were tiffing before though i'm sure we will the first episode was so good there is so many good moments and i'm just like i'm gonna rewatch this on loop once people make those edits you know i'm very very excited about it i'm really happy with the show because the show seems to know that we're watching for angel and Crowley. I personally, I was a little bit bored during the other parts of Good Omen. Like I did not really care about like the whole Agnes Snedder's granddaughter plot line or just like any of the witch hunter stuff. Like it, if I'm doing a rewatch, I'm kind of skipping over that stuff. I really only care about the angel and the demon and it feels like it's gonna be very them focused. I'm a little worried, but I'm also excited because the first episode was, mm, it was so good. But those are my plans. I will update you on my Good Omens watching. I am gonna save it until I get home and just like binge the whole thing. That is gonna get in the way of reading probably. And I'm probably gonna go edit a video right now and just go back on Amazon Prime and rewatch the Sorry Dance over and over and over again because it's so cute. But yeah, those are my plans for the weekend. Hopefully reading actually happens. I just finished Good Omens and I am flabbergasted right now. Oh my God. I was practically like screaming screaming at the TV. This felt like fan fiction in the best way, like, but oh my god, this felt like fan fiction. It felt so fan fiction-y. Even like the random other characters like Beelzebub and Gabriel, like they had like really fan fiction-y interactions too. And I'm like, oh my god, we got everything and nothing all at the same time and Neil Gaiman, I hate you so much right now. <laughs> Yeah, so season three when, I don't know, but yeah, it has to come now, right? I will say, this definitely felt like the middle book in a show. It was so, so good, but it also felt a little disjointed, whereas the original felt a little bit more complete, but I definitely enjoyed myself more during this season one because there was just so much more Crowley and Azarafa, like it was pretty much them. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's just say, if you like hurt comfort fix, this season is perfect for you, except you're not getting the comfort part. You are in the beginning, but not at the end. Oh my god, I am just gonna patiently wait for the YouTube editors to edit all the clips together for me. <laughs> the next thing I have to get on once I finish all my TBR pile stuff is reading Good Omens with the audiobook so that I can hear Aziraphale call Crowley my dear, because apparently he does that in the audiobook. It's almost one o'clock in the morning. I'm gonna watch Good Omen season one and season two clips in on YouTube until I fall asleep probably. But the adrenaline, oh my god. <laughs> 
it's still rushing through my body. It feels akin to Yuri on Ice when I was watching Yuri on Ice as it was coming out. Like, I can't believe we got this. No one do we do know that we've gotten this. <laughs> okay, I would, yeah, I need to turn this off. So now that it's the next day and I've slept very little, I did want to kind of discuss season two of Good Omens just a little bit. So spoilers ahead, the I'm sorry dance, like I'm still obsessed with that. And Aziraphale better be doing that I'm sorry dance in the next season. And you know who else should be doing the I'm sorry dance? Neil, I better be seeing him doing one. That's mainly the reason I'm, I'm mad at Neil is that he he knew we were gonna have to wait like three or four years. It's only gonna be longer because of the strike, which good, but also, er. <laughs> but looking towards season three, I loved the journey between Crowley and Aziraphale, like how they see themselves as like the dark gray, light gray. I feel like that could come into play, like Aziraphale's conscious in the next episode and like how he's dealing with Heaven's machinations as well as realizing that like they've been doing a lot of effed up shit. A lot of people have this theory about the coffee in Aziraphale and like how he's being controlled and blah 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 and like I'm sorry I don't think that's a thing. I feel like there was a lot of time spent on the coffee so like I get why and like maybe it will come up like I don't feel like Neil Gaiman really he either does stuff as a joke you know, in like Terry Pratchett, Neil Gaiman fashion, or things are important. It was a little thing, but it was also, it was there for a long time. So maybe there is some importance to it, but I honestly don't think Aziraphale was being controlled. As dumb as it is, I feel like everything does line up with his trajectory that they were putting into this season. Honestly, like I hope Crowley learns a lesson too and grows as a person. He is so not trusting and he just so doesn't believe that anything can be saved sometimes. We know he cares about humanity and like begrudgingly helps them. Maybe he will be inspired in the next season. As far as I'm concerned, like the way that this season was set up, it really is setting itself up for Aziraphale to either like have a fall to just figure out and finally like be like oh my god yeah heaven is awful or like turn in like some people are speculating Aziraphale could go full dark angel like there's so many possibilities and I really do think that this is Aziraphale's story of growth and like he yeah he needs to grow he needs to learn like I'm mad at him but also what happened to me honestly it, it makes sense for like where the story has been going this whole time I'm really excited for season three because we know that there's gonna be happy ending thank god Neil has said that at least I think season three is gonna be crazy when it finally comes I think I think it's gonna be good though but yes it is Saturday I am tired because I did not fall asleep for a very long time last night and I woke up early ish it's like 10 but we also have four books to read other stuff to do so better get cracking so it is four on Sunday now so the weekend is almost over Ugh, I hate it I just feel like I'm just starting to relax and then poof my time is gone only slept three hours last night because I fell asleep at three and then got woken up at like six so i am extremely tired and that has contributed to having a hard time staying focused on reading but also have i been on tiktok just looking for good omens edits yeah i did start seven days until june last night i read about 100 pages last night and i'm almost at the 200 page mark now so this is a literary fiction novel and i think it's recommended based on like the sad girl factor the hot girl summer factor the literary kind of romance blurring genre factor and yeah i really get it this is really good it's definitely a page turner it's basically about these two young authors who were like in their early to mid 30s they were previously acquaintances and kind of had like a whirlwind romance when they were teens and this is them like finding each other again their lives are much different and when they were first together they were in a really volatile space they had a lot of family issues they each had drug and substance abuse issues and just a lot of turmoil going on in their lives it's like second chance romance the first time was like wrong place wrong time wrong circumstances kind of a deal and like th that's my shit i love when characters like have a history with each other i feel like it brings so much more depth to characters and i really instantly fell in love with this book and these characters they feel so real they just feel really well done their connection their spark is just so intense and fun to read this author is really just great at capturing like the New York City feeling as well as like these characters and their inner lives just so much about this is really good like for a literary novel it's really like really gripping and I love like switching between the past and the present getting to learn more about their lives getting other characters perspectives sprinkled in it's just 
it's it's a really good novel and so i have about 100 pages to go and so i'm gonna continue reading it really enjoying it and i feel like i'm in the proper headspace for this right now because coming off of season two like all i want is like hurt comfort and like romance and like this has pretty much all of that there's pretty heavy trigger warnings for this book self-harm substance abuse and sexual assault a lot a lot a lot of triggers definitely recommend looking that up and the other thing is that the main character the woman character eva also suffers from chronic illness i feel like that representation is really interesting but yeah i'm just i'm really enjoying this it's really really good and it's just like again everything that i kind of want to read in this moment honestly like i have been reading good omens fanfics but i feel like it's still too early like the really good ones are gonna take a couple weeks to get out there you know and people have kind of settled their feelings and thought about stuff yeah so i'm just kind of waiting for that i don't feel relaxed but i am enjoying my book and just kind of of letting myself really rot this weekend because I haven't really gotten a moment to really do that. I'm trying my hardest to recharge, but I will continue to read. So I have about 40-ish pages left of this. I'm gonna finish it tonight gonna enjoy it but first I'm still thinking a lot of like Crowley Aziraphale stuff and I want to talk a teeny bit more because I've seen people like hint around this stuff online but I feel like I have been thinking particular things and I just want to get it out so one the first scene we see Aziraphale and Crowley making the universe as we know it I just love the idea like they were there since the beginning we are kind of learning that they're the only angels and demons that are really interacting with earth a lot and so that idea that like they care so much about humanity because like they were there since the beginning and they've lived through all of it all the significant moments like there's something so amazing about that idea like such a great thing to grip onto like for fan fiction writers and stuff like mm, just chef's kiss and then the other thing i'm thinking about is of course like the ending again i think what's really sad is that we got the job scene for a reason we got the moment that aziraphale fell or like was tempted by crowley like we we got that for a reason it was important it's important to aziraphale's story in the coming season and just like thinking about the idea that even before aziraphale is cast out of heaven at the end of of season one he just feels so much shame and guilt and he doesn't think of himself as a good person he literally is he's doing as well going with heaven as far as he can but like he's lying he's being manipulated into temptation and gluttony i guess you would you could say and like living human-esque falling into humanity because of that he views himself as like not good like a not a good angel like he tries his best being a good angel Angel being good with heaven but also like doing the right thing is like so important to him and I think like that's what we're really going to be exploring next season is the morality of heaven as well as Aziraphale's obsession with being right being good and being good in heaven's eyes versus his own but what's so interesting is that he sees the good in Crowley like he sees the good in everybody but he especially sees the good in Crowley with him wanting to bring him on as, as his second command Crowley I feel like is definitely seeing it as like you want to change me you want you know, something that did didn't fit me, you want to bring me somewhere that betrayed me. I feel like in Aziraphale's mind, it's very much like, you are such a good person, you're always doing the right thing, you don't want to admit it, but you are, and that's why I need to bring you back to heaven. One, to like save you, but two, also like, that's where you belong because you're always doing the right thing, Crowley. It's the opposite. Crowley does not see the good in himself. He thinks he's a bad person. He was a high up angel that made a mistake and got sent down. Something that Aziraphale, I feel like, is still scared about happening to him, even more so than like being erased from existence. That's the other thing too. If they bring back the Book of Life and like kind of do like Crowley or Aziraphale erased from existence, like the world would not exist without either of them. So like that's kind of crazy to think about. But yeah, Crowley has all this guilt and shame and same as Aziraphale but he just shows it in such a different way. It's so interesting that he is like doesn't see the good in himself, only sees himself as a demon, doesn't see himself as like a nice person. Like you know it's always the funny thing of like I don't see myself as a nice person, I'm not a nice person. He he is a good person. In heaven it's just all celestial harmonies and that doesn't fit his vibe. He's always an outlier, he's always wanting to do his own thing but he sees the good in Aziraphale and he sees the bad in Aziraphale too. I feel like it's a little more complicated on his side where he likes like you're just enough of a bastard to worth knowing but also like he's like oh my god how do you not see heaven is so fucked up how do you not see that you are so much better than them that they don't deserve you like crowley just thinks the world of aziraphale even when aziraphale struggles with doing 
the right thing or disobeying heaven and so it's just it's such an interesting parallel between the two of them like self-hating not having self-worth but then also like caring so deeply for the other person and believing that the other person is such a good person Ugh, i really think this is what neil gaiman is going for like i really think he is going in this direction and i i can't wait four years for this to be explored it's so potent it's so good but i need to get back to this because this is also good it's very fast paced i wouldn't say it's insta lovey because they have like a past like week fling from high school so i guess there is a little insta loveiness in it the characters are so compelling the romance is so compelling that like i don't really care i'm just really enjoying it i really like this book it's complex about complex people it's just really well written really really well done those are my thoughts the thoughts for tonight tomorrow is monday so back to work we're down to two books in a graphic novel once i finish this one so we're getting halfway through this reading vlog almost we're making our way So I don't know if I really talked about it, but I did end up finishing Seven Days in June last night. Really good, really great, like fiction-y, romance type read. I think this author just is really good about characters. Also, it is the perfect book for summer. Seven Days in June, it happens in June. There's like talks about humidity and like the heat and stuff. It gives you that kind of feeling as well as like the literary fiction, sad girl energy, hot girl summer kind of vibe. And so now I finally got the audiobook in for The Unhoneymooners, so I started this at work today, and I've read almost 68% of it, and it's like a standard romance. This is by Christina Lauren, who is a duo that mainly writes romance. I have read a Christina Lauren book before, and it was their young adult novel, and it's actually one of my favorite young adult queer novels. I honestly wish they would write more in that genre, but they mainly write heterosexual romance stories, and I think they're pretty well known for having like fade to black or like closed door sex scenes like it does have a little bit of spice but like they're kind of known for being on the more sweet side and the closed door sex side and i'm really enjoying this so far it's basically about a girl named olive her twin sister was getting married to this dude and the dude's brother she does not get along with they have like kind of a misunderstanding with each other and they kind of have like this angsty banter going on between them because of the misunderstanding but her sister at her wedding she gives everybody food poisoning and because olive is allergic to shellfish and because the main character guy is like really against buffets for sanitary reasons they end up being the only two people that do not violently throw up and so now her sister is forcing her to go on this honeymoon with the brother's boyfriend who she doesn't get along with and so it's them on this honeymoon like kind of having to pretend a little bit so there's like fake relationship and there's also like enemies to lovers rivals to lovers whatever you want to call it and i really like this they made the characters very specific i feel like honestly the misunderstanding makes sense to me as like somebody that is super like conscious of other people and always is like thinking that other people are just thinking the worst of me at all times like i super get where all of is coming from i feel like i have heard that people didn't understand that but like as someone whose brain works that way like i really got where an olive was coming from i'm really enjoying this it's romance it's fast paced it's cute it's fun it's not queer so it's like never gonna be like high in my rankings for me personally but it, it's a good fun time i'm enjoying it and so yeah i'm just gonna continue reading this but is it summary yes of course it's summary it is set in maui which this is a little bit of an older novel now i'm like very anti vacationing in hawaii because the natives of hawaii have told us not to do so this book is a little bit older so you know it's not like in the public consciousness as much to not do that so I'm kind of forgiving it there but like in my brain I'm thinking like we have a little bit more understanding of like why we shouldn't vacation in Maui so yeah there's that but overall like it's beachy it's tropical it's fun and kind of vacation-y vibes so like very much that summer feel really really enjoying that for that this might be the most summery summer book that we've read so far. So I did finish up The Unhoneymooners last night and this is like a 3.5 stars for me so a little bit below Empire of Sands. I really enjoyed the first half where they're in Maui, really fun banter, really great characterization and I really liked how it did 
take us back to I think they're from Wisconsin Wisconsin or Missouri I think Wisconsin but it took us back there we got to see them interacting and getting together in their daily lives I think the conflict worked what I didn't like was the grand gesture at the end like the makeup grand gesture I, do, I don't know I just didn't like how that went it was just kind of awkward to me and it just wasn't my favorite I feel like honestly a grand gesture didn't really make sense for this couple I would have liked to see something a little bit different for them uh, overall it was good I enjoyed it and it definitely fits the summer feels it's definitely like other side of the coin for this one you got romance you got characters figuring themselves out a little bit it's very summery it's very tropical it's like fun good times good vibes kind of situation but I like how summer books don't have to be just good vibes and just escapism like we can have a little bit of the darker side as well which I'm glad people are recommending books that are not just fluffy so yes this is another book done. I guess next we have Our Wives Under the Sea and then The Girl of the Sea, the comic, and then we can wrap this up and start talking about summer, how it feels as a book person, and then we can talk about all the seasons. So yeah, we're closing in, guys. So I don't know if I discussed it yet, but I have started the last couple books for this reading vlog. So I have Our Wives Under the Sea by Julia Armfield. And this is like very lit fic, very much like what lit fic is right now contemporarily speaking so like being a relationship between two people and it's very much just focused in on the internal feelings that they're feeling towards each other and it's very non-linear but this is like lit fic with a little bit of speculative a little bit of body horror and it is about two women who think they are married to each other but one of them is a biologist and she has gone down in a submarine and the submarine was lost on this trip and it's like her coming back her wife doesn't know what happened happened to her and we don't know what happened to her when she was under the sea in the submarine for those six months that she was lost at sea and so we're just like uncovering the details about their relationship where they are now. I like speculative fiction because it talks about different subjects like it uses the speculative thing to talk about something but it doesn't make it like a one-for-one -one thing like an illusion does but like I'm also like just trying to figure out what this scenario would be in place of like you know I'm just trying to figure out what we're talking about here in the real world if it's just like relationships that fall apart relationships where partners are separated from each other or one of them experiences something traumatic I guess it's more that line but yeah like I'm enjoying it but I didn't even read it today at work I just needed a break from it really really short I'm halfway through it already so it's just listening to it tomorrow or maybe going to the beach and reading it and just kind of finishing it up and reading it but tonight since I don't really have any specific plans. I'm going to be reading The Girl from the Sea because I just kind of need a break from our wives under the sea. So, you know, keeping it consistent with the mermaid feels, which I feel like water, sea, ocean, very summery to me. Hopefully I get to go to the beach this weekend because I haven't been to the beach yet. I love the ocean, so let's get some ocean feels. So I finished another book for the readathon, which was The Girl from the Sea, which is the graphic novel I picked for this round. I'm realizing that this is also the author that wrote Witch Boy. I knew that internally because they're married to N.D. Stevenson, but like I, I forgot. So yeah, so this one is about a girl whose mother just got divorced and she lives on this island in this like really cute town area and you know she's really struggling with the divorce and with like her brother and she basically has this plan is that you know she's just gonna fit in as much as possible in high school really go along with everybody and when she gets to college she's gonna go off do her own thing be free be gay but what disrupts her plans is this selkie is like hey you used to hang around with me blah 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 and now i'm back to hang out with you some more and i like you you kiss me I get to not be a Selkie for a little bit because of that. So Selkie is like this myth, I think it's Celtic, about like a seal that can transform into like a girl. So it's like mermaid adjacent. I personally really like the Selkie story and I liked how it was utilized in here. It was like a whole idea of like changing and shape-shifting because the main character also, like I said, is like a shape-shifter, really has like this persona that she has at school. And so I liked that. I wished that was utilized a little bit more because it was my favorite aspect of this. 
but overall the art was nice the story was nice it had some nice themes it's definitely like not my favorite graphic novel but it was cute so i'm giving it like a 3.75 stars nothing is really like breaking into favorites but what's interesting is that i've been reading these books so quickly like this is probably the fastest i've been able to do this reading vlog and i've enjoyed all of these books like i've just been having a good time vibing reading these books enjoying them and i feel like that feels very in line with summer like just being able to read and enjoy the books quickly unfortunately none of them are like favorites but i haven't gotten into a slump from any of them i've just been enjoying it having a good time doesn't just align with summer but it also aligns with my feelings of summer there's aspects i like of it but i don't love it as a season so it makes sense that these books are good but like not my favorite but anyway i have one last book to finish hopefully i can read it while at work today and then yeah we can wrap up this reading vlog so i'm back kind of had a busy week and i've also been very much obsessed with good omens very obsessed this close to writing a fanfic and i'm just like you gotta work on your own stuff courtney <laughs> like if you want to be a published author you gotta work on your own stuff you can't do fanfic but like yeah i'm like oh i'm this close i'm they're practically touching i'm that close but anyway good omen obsession aside let us get into wrapping up this vlog so i don't remember really how much i talked about where we ended things so i had our wives under the sea which i finished up it's just it was okay it was very lit ficky i liked it it just didn't do enough for me i wish there was like a little bit more there with the plot and the characters feelings it was a lot of just like them doing mundane things and I I like like that use of like the mundane with the speculative to like tell a story but like it would have worked as a short story for me it just didn't have enough for the novel to be compelling enough very even like three 3.5 stars so we started off this reading vlog with the fantasy pick which was Empire of Sands fitting into our desert fantasy because when we're thinking of fantasy summer reads we're looking for adventure we're looking for either pirates or desert I don't want to say exotic because I don't like that word but like we're looking for hotter climbs we're looking for more plot adventure kind of fun stuff travel and setting is really important we're looking for quests we're looking for a good time and this delivered it's definitely more character focused more internal not super plot heavy more character leaning but it's got the magic it's got the setting again the great use of like the desert and I liked this it fits really well into the ballpark of fantasy women coming into their own power kind of thing that I like. It wasn't perfect for me, but it was good. The writing was excellent, especially, and I'm excited to see what this author has. So for a summer read, this is like a four out of five stars. Great summer book. Could have a little more action adventure in it to be a very summery book, but a solid summery read. And as for book, it was like a 3.75 out of five stars. Enjoyable, really great. Getting into our next pick, we have Seven Days in June. This is New York. It's in humid heat. It is like sad girl, hot girl summer kind of vibes. A lot of romance. It's about a relationship. There's a lot of internal angst between these characters. It had a lot of things that I really enjoy. I love the use of the New York setting and the author sphere. Definitely recommend it for people. And I would say for a summer read, yeah, it's gonna get a five out of five stars. It has all all these kind of different elements that we think of for summer. It has the fun, playful, romance kind of vibe. It has that summery setting, the use of that summery setting, but it also has like the more internal, the more angsty, the darker moments of summer that I was particularly looking for. So for summer reads, it's gonna get a five out of five stars. And for my personal rating of enjoyment, like a four out of five stars, really good. The next pick was our fan favorite of the challenge, the book that was recommended three times ish I believe and that was the unhoneymooners by Christina Lauren it was a good time I was really enjoying myself really until the ending I just did not like the kind of fallout and then getting back together kind of sequence but as a summer read yes it is a romance it's fun it's flirty it happens on vacation the only thing that would make it not summery I guess is that it happens in December January time period so I guess it should get like a four out of five stars and for enjoyment it was a three out of five Five stars again really liked the characters was really enjoying myself until like that ending three-fourths getting into our heavy hitter literary pick we have our wives under the sea this had like mermaid speculative
of vibes, deep ocean kind of vibes, submarine. Definitely what I would look for in a summer book, but it, again, it's like that sad girl hours kind of thing. It's the more heavy hitting, more literary leaning. But in terms of vibes, I would say this is like late summer into fall. It's definitely feeling a little bit more moody, a little bit more leaning into the fall. Deep summer, yeah, I guess it could fit into that. Enjoyment, it's like a three, 3.25 out of five stars, maybe 3.5 out of five stars. For summer vibes, I'll give it a solid three out of five stars. And then for our final read, we have our middle grade pick of this time around. And this is definitely a summer pick. I think it happens during a summer vacation. So it has like that nostalgic feels of like a girl on the coast, just like running around with her friends, doing stuff over the summer, going to the beach, all of that. Summer romance. It has the mermaid silky kind of vibes. There is like a kind of nostalgia for summer vacation-y kind of feels to it. I'm gonna give it a solid five out of five stars for the summer pick. It's definitely a summer read. I wouldn't really recommend it for any other season. It's definitely summer. And as for enjoyment, like a 3.5 out of five stars. So wrapping up summer, I had a good time. Nothing really slumped me. They were all enjoyable, but all really like middle, slightly more than middle of the road books. Like nothing stands out super memorably besides Seven Days in June. Like nothing is a new favorite, but also nothing is awful here either. But as for summer picks, both the suggestions I got and the books I picked very summary. People know what to recommend for this season. They're recommending romance. They're recommending fantasy adventure. They're recommending mermaids and pirates. They're recommending books with hot, intense summer heat kind of vibes. And they're recommending books with a little bit of darkness, a little bit of sadness. But again, that happy, that adventure, that romance. People understand summer. They recommend good stuff for summer. And honestly, I was really surprised. I thought we were going to get a lot of horror, a lot of mystery thriller type vibes. I thought we were gonna get only romance. And while I did see a lot of that, there was a lot more diversity than I was expecting and it was really pleasantly surprising. But before we get into the final thoughts, let's go over summer recommendations because like I said, almost anything could be a summer book. It's very genre spanning. Unless I can pick out specifically what season the book goes into, it's a summer book. So for instance, The Wall of Middle Grade and Children's Books, pretty much everything up here is summer. We got Howl's Moving Castle, we got the Aragon series, the Septimus Heap series. Like this is the adventure, this is the fun, this is the fantasy. If we go to my other fantasy, fantasy category, The Final Empire, read it in summer so it feels very summery, but I could see it for fall. Lord of the Rings, very summery, another series I read in the summer. Oh, the Rebecca Roan Horse books, very summery to me. Lindsay Ellis series, yeah, deep summer. That's definitely Deep Summer. The Hank Green series, definitely Deep Summer feeling. What else? We got Becky Chambers, for sure. The rest of this, pretty much fall. Maybe this is summer, but that's about it. Percy Jackson, all of this, this is summer. This is summer right here. This is all Heartstopper. It could be springy, but yeah, summer. She Drives Me Crazy, Summer Perks of Being a Wallflower. Yeah, summery. This is summery. These are summery. We got some spring-ish stuff, but also these could be summery. There's a lot of fantasy adventure out there. A lot of it's gonna be summery. The middle grade, especially summery to me. Let's calm down and get into final thoughts. So again, I was just really surprised to see that the interpretation of summer was a lot more what I was looking for than I thought it would be. I was really, really worried that we were gonna end up into genres that I just don't read as much of and that I was just going to be very slumpy doing this reading vlog. Like I found the books that I was worried about. They were definitely listed, but they weren't as persistent. People definitely had their interpretations. They had a lot more recommendations that I was kind of expecting. A lot more fantasy, a lot more lick fic than I was expecting. Expecting. But getting into the bigger picture, what I think is really interesting is that I didn't do a pie chart for every season. I kind of wish I did and that I had kept my notes for every season to kind of go over the books. Kind of what I was seeing, there were some categories that showed up more in other seasons. For instance, fall, winter had a lot more of the horror, the mystery thriller, while romance was really prominent in spring and summer. But overall, a lot of times the kind of pie chart we would get from what people were recommending 
everything would be fairly similar across the board. Maybe it's because of the people I'm picking, but I'm getting a lot of fantasy, a lot of literary fiction, and a lot of romance as like the main three categories. And then we'll see a little bit of horror, a little bit of thriller, a little bit of sci-fi, speculative, graphic novel, what have you. But overall, the genres, they stayed pretty similar across the board for seasons. It's those subcategories and the books themselves that kind of makes the difference. Summer books felt the most blockbustery of every season, and I felt like for summer we were definitely getting a lot of the repeat recommendations, like books that I had seen in fall, winter, and spring. I was seeing pop up again in summer. It had the most wide range of stuff, but overall there's a lot of similarities between the months, and also the same books kept appearing. Whatever had been popular in 2021, 2022, those big books, it didn't matter what season we were looking at, those books were going to show up. The other thing is that people love doing book recommendations for fall, especially. That's the biggest one that I found the most stuff for. And honestly, spring. Spring had a lot of recommendation videos. Winter, I think it's just because people are so busy and it's like not a lot of people's favorite season. That's where I was having the most trouble, especially because I kept getting Christmas stuff and like a lot of Christian book reader recommendations, which is fine, but like that is a very niche subcategory of booktube and I didn't want to pick from that for all those reasons. But yeah, winter was the hardest to find videos for and summer was the second hardest, mostly because people were just lumping TBRs into recommendation videos or people would say it's a recommendation video and it would be a TBR and they would not be recommending books that they had actually read. And I think that's because we're getting summer recommendation videos from people that are not booktubers. Like it's a season where people want to read, they want to catch up on stuff, they want to better themselves, whatever. And so we're getting a lot of recommendations from people that are not a part of the sphere normally. Like summer is the time when the book girlies show up if they're not book girlies all year round. But getting back into those subcategories that really make the seasons different, it is really interesting. Like the horror, the mystery thriller, the gothic, the dark academia, it is very distinctly fall and that's what people are recommending these past couple years. Anything with like a wintry setting, a darker fantasy, you're gonna see it pop up in winter recommendations. People were pretty good about doing that. Spring was the season of cottagecore, it was the season of lyrical writing and just nature and forestry, all that kind of stuff. And again, summer was our blockbusters, it was our action, it was our romance, it was big sweeping genre heavy stuff. But what are some of the books that I saw popping up throughout the seasons? What I think is interesting is that there were books that I saw for at least three out of the four seasons. At least one person would recommend it, again, based on like of that book being like a big book of that year, but also they seem to pair off a lot. You will either see one book through every single season, no matter what the season is, or you will see the book in both winter and fall, and then spring and summer. For instance, Addie LaRue, I want to say I saw it in, I think I only saw it for those two seasons. It might have popped up again in spring, but like less so than it did in summer and fall, where I saw it recommended several times. Six of Crows recommended across the board, but again, popping up a lot more in winter and fall. The Cruel Prince, pretty ubiquitous, seeing it all over the place. Picture of Doreen Gray, interesting enough, was a classic that kept popping up. People like to recommend that book. The Brown Sisters trilogy, recommended across the board. I think I saw it in fall. I don't know if I saw it in winter, but I definitely saw it in spring and summer as well. It was one I kind of kept putting on my list and hoping to get to, but just like never quite got around to it. But it was popping up for every season. Heartstopper, popping up a lot. That makes sense. It's very popular. Howl's Moving Castle, very popular. I saw it in summer. I saw it in spring. I saw it in winter. It was crazy. It was everywhere. The House on the Cerulean Sea, again, it was a very big book of that past couple years, seeing it a lot. And even when it didn't make sense to me. Basically to say, if a book is popular, it's gonna end up on a recommendation video, especially a seasonal one, no matter how closely it fits into the season or not, which honestly, very interesting. There are some outliers where people were recommending stuff that did not fit the season, but overall, like, yeah, I was able to find the seasonal vibes that I was looking for. People were pretty good about recommending books to 
two seasons. Once they kind of got over the hyped books that they wanted to recommend, they were picking out gems that really did fit into the season. But I will say, one thing I've learned is that people are not good at qualifying why they're recommending something, which I want to implement into my channel as I do recommendation videos. I think that's something that I learned is actually really good and really helpful for readers is to just qualify why I'm recommending these books. It doesn't matter if you do it at the beginning of the video, what the kind of things you look for for that type of recommendation for that season, or if you recommend it based on every single book and kind of qualify every book's specifically. For the most part, a lot of people were not giving any buzzwords. People were great at recommending the books, but they weren't great at explaining why they were recommending. Not to say that those videos were not good, because again, I was finding great recommendations, a better way to do it. Giving those buzzwords, explaining why you're picking a book and not just explaining the book itself, really helpful. Especially if you're doing something crazy like me, picking 20 videos every single season and trying to find recommendations. <laughs> kind of finally, this season, this year and last year, the word of the season, no matter what season, the big word was cozy. That was our main buzzword that I saw across the board. Everybody right now is just looking for cozy books, no matter if they're actually like cozy or if they're just looking for something comforting. The big word right now is cozy. That's what people want. They want to escape. They want to relax. They want to have a good time. They want to feel comforted. It makes sense. That's all to say is that this reading journey was really, really fun. I really enjoyed my I feel like I learned a lot about creating videos, about what goes into recommendations, and just like how we think about the seasons and what we find important in the seasons. It's so interesting because seasonal reading, mood reading is really important, but there are kind of like standards, like people recommend the same books every season if it's popular, if they like it. They use similar wording like cozy across the board no matter the season. Like there's things that stay consistent at the same time. What's making the seasons different for people is really getting into the niche, into the subcategory. And that kind of like specificity is what was making the recommendations good in my opinion, because they were getting specific with things. Overall, I just, I really enjoyed this project. It was a great way to feel like I got a little bit more of the community aspect of booktube, learned a little bit more about recommending books, seasonal reading. Am I a mood reader? I feel like a little bit. I like seasonal stuff. I like reading on the season. I feel like that is something I do like, but I also feel like I could pick out a seasonal read and recommend it well now. I'm struggling to come up with some ending thoughts. Like this was just such a big project and I finished it. Yay, 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 yay. Um, But <laughs> kind of any ending thoughts for it? I wanna do something like this again. I had a good time. I learned stuff. I read a lot of good stuff. I guess I should to end with what was my favorite season. I think winter is my favorite season. I just love those darker wintry setting books. They're just really, really fun for me. Fall had some great reads, but it was definitely the season where I was not struggling the most, but definitely catching myself into slumps because it was a lot. It was just a lot. Yeah, <laughs> it was just a lot. Spring, probably I had some really good reads in that season and some really like okay reads in that season but Half a Soul is popping up as like my favorite book maybe of this project so Half a Soul and Breeding Sweetgrass are popping up as like my favorites so I guess spring can be a really good season for me. I feel like spring is definitely the season where I'm feeling the most seasonal oddly enough. Like I love fall, I love winter, I love seasonal activities but springtime is always when I'm hit with like I need Jane Austen, I need romance so it makes a lot of sense to me why I really enjoyed those books in that season. And summer, summer is just, it's the reading time. It's just when I'm reading everything so a lot less picky about summer but overall good vibes in that season. Thank you so much for watching this journey. Let me know what your favorite season is, if you got any good recommendations from these videos. I hope you guys enjoyed. I'll see you guys later and happy reading.